Um, from one David to another. So uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Dave Nutt, who's, uh, just to get the full title right, the Edmund J. Safra Professor of Neuropsychopharmacology and Director of the Neuropsychopharmacology Unit at Imperial. Dave, thanks very Thank much. Thank you. Yeah, when uh, Rupert asked me to give a talk here, I thought, well, let's come up with a catchy title. Uh, it's always a dangerous thing to do because uh, when you start to pull together the, <laughs> the answers to that question, it turns out to be a little harder than uh, one might have anticipated. And given that you're all experts on ketamine, I thought I'll just rely on the old tactic of focusing on what I do know about, and, and then you can tell me where I'm wrong uh, if I do make... Uh, correlations and overlaps with uh, with ketamine. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, and the plug, the book, by the way. I mean, if you haven't bought it, then you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> and I will, so those who have, I will sign copies afterwards. <laughs> so, declarations of interest. I've got uh, some relationships with some companies that work in the psychedelic and the ketamine field. Um, so, I'm going to focus on serotonergic psychedelics. As you probably all know, they're all agonists at the 5-HT2A receptor. Their clinical dose is remarkably predicted by their affinity. The crystal structure of the receptor in the top right is now identified. We know the binding sites. And we know that antagonists at that receptor, like Ketanserin and Risperidone, which hasn't been blocked the effects, uh, certainly they block the uh, psychedelic effects. So a little controversy as to whether they block the therapeutic effects. And these are really very interesting receptors because uh, they occupy a particular space in the brain, which is called the transmodal cortex. So this is a heat map using the tracer SIMB36, which is an agonist tracer at these receptors. And you can see the highest density of 2A receptors are in the transmodal cortex, which is the part of human cortex which has evolved most recently. It's the bit of your brain which makes you different from other primates and probably other humanoids, and uh, it's the part of the brain which does all the cross-cortical connections where you do your um, insightful thinking as to, you know, how dextra beforehand it might be different from ketamine or psilocybin. The very high-level thinking, the human thinking, is done in the parts of the brain where there are these vast density of 2A receptors. You also note the very, very low density in the midbrain and brainstem regions, which is one of the reasons psychedelics uh, are very, very safe. They don't kill you an overdose because they don't really affect um, these, these uh, core physiological uh, processes. Why they're there, we don't know. You might read this recent report review we came out with in Brain, wondering whether the 2A receptor actually patterns the development of this uh, human-specific cortex. It's, it's, it's possible they do co contribute to its uh, development. It might have contributed to its evolution. That's hard to prove. But they're almost certainly involved in major cognitive processes, such as imagination, planning, anticipation, reflection, etc. And we know, and you've heard, I think, something similar earlier this morning that with, with the NMDA receptors, and I'll come to that in the next slide, but the 2A receptors are particularly localized on the layer 5 pyramidal cells. These are the neurons which produce cross-cortical communication. Particularly, they're in, involved in the creation of uh, priors and top-down control. Uh, and 5-HT2A agonists produce a profound depolarization of those pyramidal cells, which you can see in that image there. And ketamine does the same. This is these little diagrams on the left are from a, a teaching aid that we've developed called Visualizing Psychotropic Medication, available on the BAP website. Um, I won't go through them in detail, but you can see that psilocybin is a 5-HT2A agonist and a 5-HT1A agonist. Uh, ketamine is an NMDA antagonist, and it may have some dopamine reuptake inhibitory effects. Not absolutely proven in humans yet, but it's possible. On the right-hand circle, you can see the, the current cartoon as to how these drugs work. 2A agonists directly activate the terminals of glutamatergic neurons, whereas ketamine and other NMDA and antagonists essentially take off ongoing GABA inhibition from the chandelier cells onto those um, uh, glutamatergic neurons. And the end effect is to produce a state of depolarization, hyperactivity, as 
shown in the image at the bottom. What does that do to the brain? Well, it produces a state of very altered connectivity. This is some new data you have, you'll see in, in the next few months. This is dose response curve in naive humans comparing uh, two doses uh, of psilocybin. The pink is a 25 milligram dose and the gray is a one milligram dose. And you can see the, on the left-hand image, that's the Empel-Ziff complexity measure. Red is more, and so in the blobs beneath, you see uh, vast increases in complexity following the 25 milligram dose and reduced complexity after the one milligram dose. And that's probably due to boredom. On the right-hand side, you see the opposite. You see the profound uh, attenuation of power in the alpha band. Uh, in the, um, the high dose and uh, some increase in alpha band due to boredom in the one milligram dose. And that uh, replicates a study we did many years ago now using MEG. Uh, and uh, for those of you who don't know that this particular study, uh, it's one of the uh, most exciting things I think we've ever discovered with psilocybin, which is that uh, you could use MEG, the temporal resolution of MEG, we were able to to use uh, this technique called dynamic causal modeling with Carl Friston's group and test the theory that they developed that, that there are uh, four possible ways in which uh, alpha waves are derived in the brain if you have a, a little circuit of two pyramidal cells and two interneurons. You can see them in the bottom left. Uh, and uh, the analysis came up with a very clear preference for the cytosybin working on the layer five, the deep pyramidal cells to completely disrupt alpha rhythm. So that's one thing they certainly do. We've also looked at a range of other drugs on MEG and you can see here on the right hand side in the, uh, the red uh, rectangle, you see ketamine, cytosybin, LSD, and I'll show you on the next slide, um, later slide that DMT does the same, but not using MEG. So these drugs all desynchronize activity, this profound disruption of synchrony. Blue is less power in these different frequency ranges going from delta at the top down to gamma at the bottom. And you can see in contrast on the left hand side, you see the GABA agonist type drugs like Zolpidem and Gaboxidol producing vast increases in power, which are strongly associated with different forms of consciousness, mostly sedation and uh, reduced thinking compared with the opening up the mind that you see with the psychedelics. And you also see parampanol, and that's an interesting, people are talking today about glutamatergic mechanisms. This is a licensed AMPA antagonist. Why it's not being used to probe questions about, for instance, is AMPA, are the AMPA receptors the, the net down target of ketamine uh, is a question that I throw to you. It's available, it's licensed, um, it produces a very different profile of action compared with ketamine. And alcohol, of course, in the middle there, which you all sampled last night, uh, is also not that ketamine-like, as you probably gathered. Well, yesterday we heard um, about Mesmer, uh, who may, may have got it wrong. Helmholtz came a bit later, but Helmholtz kind of got it right. Helmholtz created the concept, I think, the first, first person to come up with the idea that the brain is an inference-making machine. Uh, and essentially, he, he was arguing that uh, our brain creates what's out there. Um, and we now call those inferences priors. And I think we can say that our work with psychedelics does strongly support the fact that Helmholtz was right. And I just want to talk you through the, our current conceptualization of what psychedelics do in, in terms of disrupting brain function. And I'm going to use vision as the example. You're all aware your brain's not a camera. If it was a camera, you'd have loaded up your memory banks completely by the age of one. What, whoops, sorry. What the brain is, is a, a device for decoding the electrical impulses, which come from the retina, go into large chunks of the posterior parts of the cortex. And together, those different parts of the cortex come up with a solution to, or an estimate of what's out there. So your visual brain computes what's out there based on the retina inputs. And your frontal brain, this transmodal cortex, uh, predicts what you're supposed to be seeing. 
based on previous knowledge, and those are, those are what we call priors. And if they're discordant, then the priors are updated. And uh, mostly we don't update our priors because mostly we know that they don't need updating. So when I stood up here, you all saw who I was, and I could have morphed into a bear or a tiger, and you probably wouldn't have noticed because you know that's impossible. So why bother to double check well who I am? But under psychedelics, things can change. And uh, those of you who were tripping now, I might look like a tiger, I suppose. But uh, psychedelics disrupt the ability of those layer five neurons to create that. And, uh, and that's why when people have these simple hallucinations under psychedelics, uh, they have them. Because we know from at least 60 years of work resulting or going through Nobel Prizes for Hubel and Weasel, that the creation of primary visual processes in the cortex is, starts with simple shapes, colors, and movements like this. And so, in fact, those hallucinations under psychedelics are actually allowing you, for the first time, probably since you were a baby, to see the primary workings of your visual cortex because the disruption of those layer 5 pyramidal cells prevents the creation of the more completed image. And that in itself, I think, is quite an interesting, entertaining discovery. But more recently, we've been able to show that there is a disruption of priors as well. And this is a recent paper that came out by Chris Timmermans in our group. It's a, a multimodal imaging. It was an EEG fMRI study. We haven't found any fMRI data yet, but these are the EEG, EEG data for DMT. And you can see um, in the top image A, you can see the profound uh, disruption of the alpha rhythm, like other psychedelics. Uh, on the right-hand side, in the, right, the, the colored brain shows you connectivity. And you can see the majority of the increased connectivity in the brain is in those brain regions where there's a high density of the 2A receptors, very little change in the sensory motor cortex, for instance. But the bottom left is the interesting one. The bottom left looks at traveling waves. And you can see uh, there are two directions the waves can travel in the brain. They can either travel back from the front to the back, or they can travel forward from the back to the front. And under DMT, you see that the backward traveling waves, which we assume are these proxies for priors, are attenuated, and the forward traveling waves are increased. And uh, so I think with that is, again, evidence that psychedelics disrupt frontal generation of priors and allow other uh, sensations, vision, auditory, etc., to promulgate. And as a feature of the disruption of rhythmic activity in the brain, uh, the brain becomes more connected. Uh, this has almost become a meme now for, for psychedelic uh, imaging. It's a paper came from King's College, Department of Mathematics. There are 7,200 connections in each of those, and there are statistical connections. The likelihood of a particular voxel in the brain changing its activity in relation to another one. On the left-hand one, you have this, what's called the small world brain, the normal brain. And your brain is so efficient, it's 10 times more efficient than any human computer in terms of energy use per computation, because most of the computation is done in the small world very locally. So the visual brain talks to the visual brain, the auditory brain to the auditory brain. Of course, if you see a bus bearing down on you, you want to get your legs moving to run out the way. So there's got to be some cross-cortical talk. But the human brain is so huge, uh, and the energy costs of cross-cortical talk are so vast, that the efficiency is gained by downloading almost all the processing into the small world. And that, can, that makes the brain very efficient. It means that all, you know, you're all understanding every word I say, because we've all learned how to do that. But on the other hand, if you learn things that are wrong, and an analogy might be that if you as a child are abused, but you interpret that abuse as being your fault, because children have a much more self-centric view of the universe, it can be very difficult to unthink that. <clears throat> and those deeply ingrained negative thoughts underpin quite a lot of uh, um, mental illness. <clears throat> Psychedelics um, change the organization of the brain so that there's massively increased connectivity. It goes back to the connectivity it was when you were a child. And one of the theories of education and learning is that you take a brain in which all things are possible and 
constrain it so that basically we all do the same thing as everyone else has done. Uh, and for a period during the psychedelic trip, you can see things differently and you can see the, the reasons for the past and you can also come up with potentially new ways of thinking about that and new ways of thinking about the future. And that's also true for other psychedelics. This is a very you know, clear image of why LSD produces such very profound uh, visual uh, hallucinatory states because the connectivity of the brain is massively enhanced under LSD. This is a, a particularly elegant study because we actually plotted out the distribution of V1. You can see the little green blobs at the back of the brain. And under placebo, V1 mostly is doing the small world. It's just talking to itself and a little bit to the hippocampus, whereas under LSD, V1 talks to everywhere. And that also explains phenomena like synesthesia. So what might be going wrong in disorders uh, like depression or addiction? Uh, and again, to go back a little bit into history and to into art, so there's this wonderful phrase from William Blake that mine, man has created mind-forged manacles. That's the uh, man being manacled to his, uh, actually his belief in war, but uh, that's another topic. And uh, we've taken the view that these maladaptive priors, the assumptions that people make about themselves and their, their worth or worthlessness or their desires or uh, size, etc., in those in different disorders, uh, are shackles of the mind. And uh, can we break them by changing the brain? And of course, we know we can. We know, going back to the work of Helen Mayberg, who uh, reported in this uh, remarkable paper in 2005, uh, that brain imaging studies, which in which she had identified that CG25 was a significant uh, driver of depression, it's correlated rather well with the, uh, the comments of uh, William James of his own depression. It's a positive and active anguish, a sort of psychical neuralgia wholly unknown to normal life. That insight, and uh, I know we got Wayne in the audience here, so I'm very conscious that he also. Would, uh, has done a huge amount of work looking at CG25 engaged in, in depressive generation. This idea that there's a part of the brain which generates depression is, is truly fascinating. And it completely uh, check, turned on our head most of our concepts of what depression was. And as Helen did, she asked the question, could we turn the, the anguish off? And she succeeded, of course, with deep brain stimulation. But, but we know that many other treatments of depression dampen down activity in CT25. And this literature goes back to, the, to work to ECT studies in, in the 90s. Uh, so all those effective treatments for depression attenuate activity in CT25. And the truth is, the reason we started doing psilocybin depression studies was because psilocybin also dampened down activity in that brain region. And, but it did it rather rapidly, much faster certainly than SSRIs or CBT. Uh, there was another reason though we were interested in studying psilocybin in depression, and that was the profound disruption that um, psilocybin and other psychedelics produced to the default mode network. It's likely that the disruption of that network is uh, one of the reasons you get this. Uh, a profound disorganization of brain activity and increased connectivity. You can see that this, the default mode network doesn't exist uh, under psychedelics. And, uh, and that, of course, explains many of the phenomena of the psychedelic experience, like of being atomized, floating into space, going into different dimensions, etc. But we were particularly compelled by this study coming out, coming out of Yale about the same time from Berman's group, showing that the default mode network was over-engaged in depression. And that, that was over-engagement was also driven by the uh, overactivity of CG25. So it, ma it made a, a lot of sense to try to dis attenuate the default mode. If it's overactive in depression, maybe that would also lift depression. And there was one example I could find of, um, of ketamine also disrupting the default mode network. And this is the paper on S-ketamine from the Vienna group um, a couple of years ago. So, so it's conceivable that... that it's a part of the uh, impact of ketamine in depression is through a similar process. But I'll, I'll just note here that uh, Bill Deakin in Manchester, before then, a long time ago, showed 
without any particular, I think, anticipation of ketamine being a therapy, the ketamine also switched off CG25 in healthy volunteers. Of course, there are differences between ketamine and, and psychedelics. And I think perhaps one of the most intriguing ones is the duration of action. So uh, eventually we managed to do a study, a single 25 milligram dose of psilocybin produced profound and long-lasting reductions in depression scores uh, in people who were treatment resistant. Uh, and obviously ketamine does the same, but the effects are much, much less enduring. And I don't know why that is. And I think that's one of the very really key questions. And that's why I flagged up the AMPA receptor drug, Parampanel, because if it may be that there are aspects of ketamine's action which are uh, undermine its therapeutic effect, and that may be why you have to repeatedly dose it. But perhaps one of the most interesting um, recent insights we've gained into uh, the actions of psilocybin, and this came from a study where we compared psilocybin with escitalopram, is to look at brain modularity or the, the ability of the brain to flip between different uh, functional states. And following uh, psilocybin treatments in, in both of our two treatment trials, we found that patients given psilocybin had increased flexibility, reduced modularity uh, one day, or in this case, three weeks after their uh, 25 milligram dose treatment. And that reduction in modularity, increased flexibility, as you see in the top images in red, correlated with the uh, recovery uh, in terms of uh, outcomes on, on, on the Beck depression inventory, and also was correlated with increased connectivity, particularly the executive network, which is that EN network there. And that increased connectivity of the executive network, of course, accords beautifully with people's ability to do things when they've got better from depression. They can actually think, they can read, they can attend, etc. Escitalopram didn't do that. Escitalopram lifted mood, but it didn't increase flexibility. Uh, so that suggests there are fundamental different mechanisms between SSRIs and psychedelics, even when people are well. And again, what's quite <clears throat> intriguing about these uh, findings is that it accords, they accord well with patients' um, descriptions. Many of them use computer analogies. I guess that's because uh, what's central to, to human life at present uh, so this one, what, it was like when you defragged a hard drive on your computer. I experienced blocks going into place, things being rearranged in my mind. I visualized it was all put into order, and I thought, my brain is being defragged. How brilliant is that? Another patient, my outlook has changed significantly. I'm more aware now it's pointless to get wrapped up in endless negativity. I feel as if I've seen a much clearer picture. And of course, many depressed people know that they aren't as bad as they think. Certainly patients with OCD and patients with anorexia know that their belief systems are wrong, but they can't change them. And I think what psychedelics seem to do is allow people to change because at least for a period of time during the trip, their brain is changed. And then there's the other interesting question about neuroplasticity. Um, and this has been studied in, in animals a lot, and you've seen slides already about this. And studying it in humans is actually quite tricky. Uh, but there is a tracer, which is a, a measure of, of synaptic vesicle protein, called UCB, UCBJ. And um, it's been developed as a pet tracer. And where is Sophie? There she is. This is her study. Put your hand up. This is her study. So ask her the questions afterwards. Um, so this, 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 this study is, is interesting because it looked at depressed people. And it also looked at healthy volunteers, and it looked at the impact of ketamine on the binding of UCBJ. So the, the argument or the hypothesis was that the trip, the ketamine experience, would potentially promote synaptic plasticity, uh, increase the growth of um, synaptic spines, and therefore increase the density of this tracer. And uh, they didn't find that in the healthy volunteers. So it didn't seem to change at all. Um, but there was a relationship in the uh, depressed group in that depressed people who had low levels of binding, and that's the, those are the blue blobs at the bottom left, there was an increase in binding after ketamine, whereas there was, a, uh, if anything, a decrease in the people who 
had higher levels to start with. So it's unclear at present as to whether this tracer does actually uh, measure a, a relationship between uh, a psychedelic trip and uh, synaptic growth afterwards. Um, and we found the same. You'll be pleased to know, Sophie, we've confirmed that there is no impact in healthy volunteers, even with a bigger dose. So we use a gram, uh, 100 million, a gram dose rather than your, your gram, one big big dose, sorry. And we're doing a DMT study at present because there is um, some evidence in pigs that DMT will upregulate this tracer, but I don't know. It may be we need, we need better tracers. Uh, and then I'm going to come to my last slide, which is where I sort of try to sum it up. And um, what I've done here is I've highlighted what I think are obvious differences, obvious similarities, and some uncertainties. And um, I'm quite happy to stop talking now because um, I'd be interested in knowing whether those of you in the audience who know more than I do about ketamine want to clarify some of those questions. So uh, I'll stop. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much indeed. It's good to have a little bit of time for some questions. Tiago. Hello. I think I got it wrong, but in the first slides on the mag, you show that propofol rises the, the power in the brain? In the gamma frequency, yes, that's right. It's only in the GABA frequency. Yeah, that's when you're anesthetized. Yeah. Because it's a well-known um, birth suppression agent. It well, whether, yeah, and that may well be independent of those effects or due to that effect. I don't know. Uh, so, it's, so it's only only looking at the GABA, that, that's when it rises the activity of the GABA. Is that it? I'm not sure what you're saying. Are you saying that... Um, the gamma, you can look at all the different frequencies there. There you go. Yeah. You show that propofol rises up more power on spectral changes. Yeah. For, for so I gamma. presume that this massive increase in, in, in low gamma power is, a, is to do with being asleep. That's okay. what I presume. The increase in beta power is very classic of a GABA agonist. You can see all the GABA agonists right across the board do that. The beta frequency power goes up for everything. Um, why there's a, f a fundamental difference between gabapentin and tigabine is a GABA uptake blocker. They produce very strange alterations in consciousness, like catalepsy. Um, but they, why there's such a difference between those and the anesthetic propofol is unknown. Okay, thank you. I think we can add a couple of extra um, similarities, and there's the reduction to your table, which is one of which is illustrated here, which is the reduction in alpha power, which is very profound in in ketamine and yeah. very, very, very easy to see. And then obviously from your uh, earliest slide about the, the mechanism of action, both lead to a glutamate surge. Yes. Um, yeah. Can I ask just whether there's, whether we know anything about the, the duration of binding of psilocybin to the 5-HT2A receptor that might account for its duration, the, 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 the duration of the trip? Obviously, you know, I've always wondered whether if you, if, if you induced you a very, it. very long trip with ketamine, whether you would in fact have the it's same... It's a really interesting question. No, that's a, I think that's a, it's a, it is an interesting question. Of course, the whole duration thing is being turned on its head with the new... Uh, well, with DMT, uh, where the, obviously the, the effect is very short in terms of the, this kind of complexity, but, but the duration of effect clinically might be long. But it, it's a it's a moot point whether you and, can and just on the on the specific question of the duration of binding to, to the five HT two A receptor, do we know anything about that? We uh, we don't know, but we know we can abort it, or at least we haven't done that. But uh, we know historically, you can terminate trips with a two A antagonist. Yes, so getting the getting the drug off the receptor terminates the trip. trip. Okay, thank you. Other questions. Colleen. Thank you, David. A fascinating area and a, a wonderful um, overview. I, I was intrigued in your in that table about the rapid tolerance to psychedelics, um, and just wondering about what, what you think the implications are for treatment. You know, there are people now thinking about rather than just two doses, should we be giving three, you know, more doses? 
uh, and also f- you know, the implications for retreatment. You know, as, in, as you know, in, in Australia, yeah. we are embarking on clinical yeah. use of psychedelic yeah. treatments. Yeah. Uh, does it make sense, for example, to have one course with two doses and then six months later do, do it again? Well, the tolerance develops with psychedelics over three days. At least that's what we have been told by the U.S. military. I don't know if anyone's done a, repeated that experiment. Yeah, so re- if, you know, taking it every day is likely not to be very effective, whereas we showed three weeks, in depressed people three weeks apart, there was no obvious attenuation. Obviously, the content of the experience is obviously completely, often utterly different between the first and the second, but there's the magnitude of the effect seems to be similar. So, so the nature of the acute tolerance isn't known. We presume it's some kind of desensitization of that 2A receptor. And, and I think, David, it might have been one of the, uh, might have been one of the Carhartt-Harris open label studies that had someone who had had psilocybin before, although years ago, yeah. who had much lef- less of an impact on her depression, antidepressant efficacy, than other people who were treatment naive. Do you think that's something? I mean, we see that sometimes with ketamine. Even yeah, like yeah. a year later, people who have been treated before, they don't have the same response. Yeah, I think that probably talks a little bit to the placebo question, doesn't it? Expectation and novelty. But I'd be surprised if there were enduring pharmacological changes. But I don't know. There are clearly enduring psychological changes. Which, so maybe there are others. Okay. I'm going to have to stop us, I'm sorry, for the very important job of coffee. Um, okay. So thank, thank you. you very much indeed, Dave.